Well, good evening. Welcome to this evening's Committee of the Whole. It's November 15th. It looks like we have three topics to cover this evening. First is a presentation by Joe Turnage of ComEd, sharing the annual report. We have an overview of the city's community events for 2023, as well as a discussion of the Community Events Foundation overall. And finally, we have an incentive program for restaurants and retailers, which is an initiative brought forth by the Economic Development Committee. Now, prior to getting into these subjects, I'd like to remind everyone that the floor will be open to the audience or public for 20 minutes to 20 minutes to address the City Council on matters that are specific to this evening's agenda after the council has discussed the item with staff or the presenter. It's requested that persons wishing to address the city council on the agenda item keep their comments to no more than five minutes in length. And again, comments must be addressed to the council as a whole through the mayor. And of course, profanity in any form may not be used or tolerated. And having said all that, Mr. Turnage, if uh, your presentation is queued up and you're ready to cover the comments annual report, the floor may now be yours. <coughs> All right, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, trustees, and city officials. For the record, my name is Joe Turnage, and I'm here to deliver to you your annual report from ComEd. All right, so what we're going to look at during this review here, we're going to look at your 2022 reliability. We're going to look at the different system enhancements that ComEd performed throughout 2020, 2022, and what we're going to be looking at in 2023. Uh, we're also going to be looking at the uh, vegetation management, call center data, and e-channels information. So for uh, 20, this is going to go into 2021, by the way. So for 2021, if you take a look, uh, overall, you guys achieved a 99.95% reliability rate in 2021. And uh, if you look at the yellow section, I have a... Uh, a legend up top that identifies the different types of outages that occurred in Rolling Meadows. And as you can see, uh, we had quite a bit of uh, storm-related outages and a little bit of uh, non-storm-related. This section here talks about the outages in terms of frequency. If you look along the bottom line there, that's 2021. And if you look closer to the one all the way to the right, the uh, weather-related looks like 0 0.17. And a lot of the other uh, related outages were associated with uh, trees. And that's 0 0.38. So quite a bit of uh, vegetation and weather-related outages. This here's a circuit map, and this, this circuit map here outlines the location of each circuit in the city of Rolling Meadows. This uh, piece talks about our system enhancements. If you look along the, the bottom area there under circuit year and status, we, uh, we installed certain fuses and we also uh, uh, put in a lot of underground cable, and we replaced some underground cable as well. And we did that throughout uh, 2021. If you take a look there under the year, we did quite a bit in 2022. Yes? So those are completed now since they say planned for 2022? Yes. They the, are completed. Those are, those are most, most of those are complete now, so, because we're closing out the year, so. Right. Thank you. Yeah. When we initially did this report, they were in the plan status because we delivered this report in uh, May, I believe. So, more system, more system enhancements. This form here speaks about the uh, thermography that we do, and what we do in thermography. It's a heat sensing gun. We patrol each circuit, and we uh, we test it using a heat sensing device. And what that does is it identifies certain areas where the circuit may be heating up, and that's the potential for an outage to occur. And at that time, we make those corrections to minimize any uh, unexpected outages that may come up.
This here is more maintenance that we've done in 2021 in addition to 2022 where we've uh, completed corrective actions, thermography program, in addition to overhead inspections of our uh, 12 kV and 34 kV lines. This here's our vegetation management piece. So as you guys noticed, the first, uh, in the earlier part of the presentation, we had over 0 0.30 uh, in terms of outages associated with trees. So this here is gonna help significantly with that because we did quite a bit of uh, tree trimming in 2021 and below we completed some of 2022 in addition to we have uh, other circuits that we're planning to complete tree trimming on in 2022, well this year, so. Most of that's most likely complete at this time. This is our customer service information and from the looks of this in 2021, um, our team is spending a little bit more time answering calls. This is system-wide, so this particular uh, information here is not specific to the City of Rolling Meadows for the, for the Comment Service Territory as a whole. We're spending a little bit more time when we speak with customers, and that's because we want to make sure that we are taking our time and answering each and every question in an effort to prevent a repeat call from uh, customers. And as you can see, a lot of our customers are also using our voice response unit. And we have a very low abandoned call rate. That's when a customer calls in and hangs up for whatever reason and don't get the opportunity to speak to a representative. This is our e-channels information. Uh, as you can see, as we go into 2021 from 2017, our mobile transactions have increased. Our uh, outage alerts have increased. That's, that means customers are report using the, uh, the uh, ComEd app to report outages. Mentions of ComEd uh, decreased quite a bit in 2021. Our Twitter followers have gone up in addition to our Facebook fans. All right, that'll end my report. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Turnage. Uh, any questions? Any additional questions beyond status project? Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Appreciate it. All right. So, moving on <coughs> from Comments Annual Report, we will now go into the community events and the community events foundation overview. For this, I understand Manager Sabo, you and uh, Lori Cizak will be tag teaming this. Do you want to begin? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll give a quick intro as Lori comes up to. The podium. Yeah, if you want to step up, and I'll get everything going here. I'm trying to get our PowerPoint up on the screen in the meantime. Give us some moments. Saw it flash for a second. While that's loading, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so, in the agenda packet is a report and memorandum that provides uh, a uh, proposed event schedule for 2023. And that schedule for this evening is, is for the council's review and discussion. Uh, not the, the schedule itself is not set in stone. So for this evening, if the council does have any feedback on events, how many how, or the type of events, or if we want to combine or anything new, um, we can have those conversations this evening and, and work through those. In addition to that, um, we will provide an overview of the Community Events Foundation. Um, the functionality, the way that it works, and then hit on and touch a little, touch a little bit on the financials of the uh, of the Community Events Foundation, as well as what's included in the 2023 budget. Um, and again, uh, we're happy to discuss uh, direction from the council on how we move forward with the Community Events Foundation, as far as the board and uh, financial management, all those different components overall. So it looks like. We have Wasim running to the rescue on uh, on the PowerPoint. So we're going to do a little flip-flop. I'm going to start on the financials, then we'll come back to schedule, sure. if that's okay, okay, just so we can get the PowerPoint going. Um, the, the CEF, uh, I'll provide an overview of the CDF, and again, a lot of this information is included in the agenda packet. Um, it was established in 2011 at the direction of the City Council in an effort to uh, allow for 
tax deductible donations to be made to support the city's events as well as to support the uh, city's uh, museum, the historical museum. And so at the time when it was formed, it was incorporated with the state of Illinois as a 501c3 corporation as a nonprofit. And it was established through the bylaws that there would be a board of directors consisting of three directors, which also hold the positions of president, secretary, and treasurer. So at the time that it was established, um, there was the city manager was the president. There was an alderman who held the role of secretary and the finance director was the uh, treasurer. Currently, as that trend has just continued, um, when I joined the organization as well as Finance Director Talkington, um, we had stepped into those roles and then you know, are here to discuss how we manage that moving forward. But for purposes of remaining in good standing with the Secretary of State's office with our 501c3 status, we've kept the board intact and, and have met occasionally to review the financials as well as talk about the plans for the CEF and the plan for this conversation with the city council. Per the bylaws, which those are also included in the agenda packet, the, the bylaws state that we meet annually in March, but however, we've met as needed from time to time as, as different uh, things come up. And so with the PowerPoint working, I'll go ahead and, would you like me, Mayor, to continue on the CEF side and then we can talk about the schedule, or do you want to jump to the schedule and then come back? Whatever seems logical for you in, in the sequence you're currently on is fine with me. Okay. Okay, so well, I'll, I'll just keep going with this and then we'll jump back. So um, with respect to the, the events foundation itself, um, the foundation has a bank account which operates separate from the city's budget. It's not held in the city's budget accounts um, in the sense that it's, it's not treated as a government operating account. It was established according in, in 2011 purposefully so that it operates independent of the city and can function as its own independent nonprofit. As of the September account, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, bank, account, bank reconciliation, there was $119,729 in that account. Um, staff has, has gone through and, and handled reconciliations to balance both income as well as expenditures. Uh, revenues for the CEF are derived through tax deductible donations. What we're seeing often are donations that come through uh, at various events that the city holds. Um, there's also a mechanism by which uh, I believe people can make donations through Amazon or, or other online purchasing types of opportunities. And so we'll see those revenues come into, into the CEF itself. One thing I do wanna note based on our analysis of the, of the CEF financials within that fund specifically is that the revenue that we've been getting in has not been enough on an annual basis to support all of the expenses related to the city's special events that we hold every year. And accordingly, it's been used as a mechanism to supplement our special events and to pay for the various different expenses that arise with events. So historically, it's been used for bands. Um, we've purchased event tents, so uh, 10 by 10 tents that are used at our city events as well as candy supplies, miscellaneous items. One thing in our analysis and, and in reviewing uh, city records from, from the time that at least I, I joined the organization, there, there hasn't been a policy set in place that we could find on staff side that establishes what is the CEF being, you know, what, what funds or expenses will the CEF be used for versus what will the city's budget pay for. And so accordingly, when the council reviews the budget annually, you'll see in there a few different uh, line items and they're, and they're organized in different places. Molly, uh, finance director talking to and I have talked about organizing those into one specific section so everything's compiled. But throughout the entire budget, there is uh, approximately $210,000 budgeted for events expenditures. And so on the screen, you'll see that the table there represents where those budget amounts are, are going towards. So the $83,000 on top are the general events that covers our, our Friday's Rock events, uh, the Hoedown event in October, the Halloween Fest, all of the different events that we spell out within the, within the budget. Um, in addition to that, we budget funding for holiday decor and, and holiday celebration, the tree lighting event that's, that is coming up. Um, our largest event expenditure is typically 4th of July with the parade as well as fireworks. 
uh, with fireworks expenses and the cost of fireworks going up, those fireworks costs uh, have been budgeted to increase annually, and so we've accounted for that going into 2023 as well. Um, in addition, Veterans Committee hosts a couple events each year, so they handle the Memorial Day Parade as well as the Veterans Dinner, which, which just occurred. Um, we have funds in the budget. There's 9,000 in there for event photography and videography. However, we've been using only about 1,500, and that even may be coming down a little bit further. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to, I, I included a note, there's, there's a police outreach uh, item in the budget of $70,000, which is directly tied to a uh, payment that's made to the city under an agreement with Nature's Care um, to provide education and outreach to the community. And so the police department has utilized those funds for National Night Out, the block party, as well as for purchasing handouts and, and things to engage with the community. Staff also took a look at what our expenses are on the staffing side. Um, the city does host a number of events and, and we'll review those momentarily. Um, this number that we put together is not exact or finite, so this is an estimate, and we believe a little bit on the lower end of the estimate. So if we were to true up and, and actually get a true accounting of what the numbers are, we would anticipate this might be higher. The way that we put this together, given our, our, the way our payroll system works, is we took the number of hours worked by department per event, and then uh, applied the average uh, hourly rate for that department, and then also built in uh, on the bottom line a FICA amount, which is about 7.65%, I believe. And then I added in uh, to account for the number of hours. We, we estimate about 75% of these hours are likely overtime hours being worked in the evenings or on holidays. And, and, and arrived at that about $40,800 number. Once we get uh, our new payroll system set up, which we're, we're getting to the finish line here very shortly, we're building in uh, project accounting, which means that when our staff is working on different events, those hours will be coded to that specific event so that we can then track exactly what our expenses are on the personnel side um, related to our special events. But based on what we were able to pull out of our current payroll data, this represents the hours worked by department, and then we used some, some data uh, mechanisms to get to an approximation. And so at this time, I will transition back to Assistant to the City Manager, Lori Cizak, who will cover our events calendar. And then after that, we will uh, welcome any questions or feedback. Thank you, Rob. Good evening, everybody. The proposed list of 20... Uh, Rob, can you go to the, there we go, thank you. The proposed list of 2023 community events for the City of Rolling Meadows will offer exciting music, features, and attractions to entertain residents near and far. The 2023 event lineup will be similar to 2022, except for the following minor changes. The August Wind Down by the Creek event will have a new name and now be called a Friday's Rock Concert. Uh, this is because it closely mimics those concert events that are now serving alcohol. And uh, secondly, the city's holiday celebration usually takes place on the first Thursday in December. Since the 2023 date will land this event on December 7th, staff proposes that we move the date one week earlier to Thursday, November 30th, just so that it doesn't fall so late in December. Um, so as Rob had pointed out, please know that none of these events are set in stone and we're certainly open to Council's feedback on these events or suggestions about others that might be a good fit for our city. Thank you. And, and one quick note as well. So um, in, this year, in this year's event calendar that was proposed, um, we included, there were a certain events that didn't take place. Taste of the Town was one of them. Um, in that event, we, we found in talking with our, our, our restaurant operators that it was difficult for them to have the staffing and equipment and, and even food projections on how much to bring out with, with things like the pandemic, which was happening earlier in the year and just our, our macroeconomic conditions. As well, um, we decided to shift our focus away from the business showcase and try to find a different way that we can work with our business community and, and uh, work with the, uh, with the Chamber of Commerce on, on potentially collaboration on some sort of an event. And lastly, the St. Patrick's Day um, uh, luncheon that was historically included. However, the amount of resources and staff time that went in, we figured we would reall reallocate those resources again to try to uh, get some good bands and, and just account for increasing costs that are going into the event operations. 
And so we're happy to answer any questions and, and invite any feedback from the council. Nice. Thank you, Manager Sabo. Um, first and foremost, thank you, Lori. I think it, in my opinion, I think it goes without saying that, and I don't want to put words in anyone else's mouth around this table, but I believe we all appreciate the events that are put on within the city. I know the residents appreciate them. And we all understand the amount of work that it takes to execute these in addition to the planning. Um, just because we see a calendar of events that are forecast to be out there, there are months of advanced work that's <coughs> necessary to make them be the successes that they are. And so when we do talk about this, I, I don't want it to be misconstrued as reductive or critical in any negative fashion. It's hopefully to, to make it better and the experience more desirable to attract um, consumers and individuals from other communities so that they can reap the same joy and benefits that we and residents in our community do. <coughs> but are there any questions or, or comments? Yeah. Alderman Sessi? Yeah, just a, a handful of them. Just for clarification. First off, I'm 100% in favor. I kept lobbying uh, the former city manager for probably a decade before this ever uh, got created that something like this needed to be created. Um, so with that said, uh, back on your slide with the CEF budget, yep, that one. So, next one. Nope, next one, yeah. So first off, the $119,000 in the bank account, is all of that money from donations? Yes. Okay. Yeah, to, my, to my understanding, all of that fund, the funds are all donations and then are rolled continuously forward. So it's a cash operating account. Okay, good, good, good. Um, and then the, uh, uh, on the other, so what, what, I'm, what I'm wondering about is I know when I was running a lot of the city events, um, I always got billed back for um, public works, part, uh, police, things like that and we would bill back our volunteer organizations for those man hours. Are we billing back this account? So this this account we do not bill back. So if, if there are special events where police officers are hired back for um, a special assignment, those events, the event organizers will get billed and pay for the time based on a, a preset dollar amount that the city establishes based on the, the cost of providing overtime officers. Um, those independent entities will pay the city for those hours. However, those funds go into the city's general fund to cover the cost of, of those officers. They do not go into the events foundation. Okay. I guess the question was, is the events foundation being billed for those hours? The events, By the, city. the events Foundation is not. So so as far as the Events Foundation paying the city back is mm -hmm. what you're asking? No. Right now, the, the Events Foundation has been used to pay for specific expenses but has not been billed for um, staff time or, or any of those types of expenses. Okay. I'm not saying they should because that was always a pet peeve of mine that I felt stifled a lot of the volunteer organizations in the past because it was insistent that there be police. So we would hire off-duty cops from God knows what county to, to go to be at like carnivals and things like that. Uh, I also noticed that the, on the uh, firework, it says uh, parade, band, fireworks. Um, I know the city historically has given I think at a, at a way I'm going back a uh, uh, decade or two. Um, it was uh, twenty-five thousand dollars a year for fireworks and six thousand dollars for the for the parade. So, can I assume that that thirty-six, that thirty-eight, is the CEF's portion of what is paid for Fourth of July? No, the, or are the, they actually paying for that now? This so this the the numbers that are included here are the are the numbers that are in the city's budget. Oh, okay. So these are, these are city so it's gone up to thirty eight, which budgets. is reasonable. Yes, yes. Okay, that's awesome. And then lastly, are we doing anything through? Well, obviously we probably are because I don't know if that's all individual residents' contributions, but uh, we used to be able to raise. Around uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars through corporate donations. 
for our community events. I'm wondering if we're still going after those. We are. So one of the, one of the mechanisms to fundraise for the foundation is the banner program. So uh, along Kirchhoff Road, you'll see the light pole banners will have sponsorships from the different corporate entities. And so part of the cost that's paid by the corporations pays for the expense to produce and install the uh, banners, yeah. but then there's a, an additional amount that goes into the CEF as part of that. Laurie, yeah, awesome. any additional uh, fundraisers with corporate that so you... So we, we did a first-time sip and paint this past <laughs> year, which, you know, it was small, but it's definitely something we can build on and, and certain things like that. Uh, others that come to mind as we receive grants, uh, Northrop uh, offers a grant usually it's between 2500 uh, to 5000 I think last this past year was 4000 um, so it's okay so we're, we're working no major fundraisers mm -hmm. but it's something we definitely w would like to improve on yeah okay. one, one, one thing also Joe <coughs> left momentarily but we moments ago but we also received a grant for a holiday lighting event program this year of 20 2500 I believe mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so that'll help pay for that event. So we're looking for different opportunities to find funding to pay for and offset um, the money that's included in the budget to try to bring those numbers down and, and find different ways to pay for our events. Uh, and I know we don't necessarily have um, the youngest members of the community in our found, you know, helping with our foundation, but I do know that uh, Fourth of July was usually good for several thousand dollars just with red kettles you know just walking support you know support the fireworks and people would throw money in the thing it's a little bit harder now because people don't carry cash yeah. but uh okay i'm glad you're excellent thank you thank you thank you other man um uh, i have a couple questions unless others have all the right um thank you um, out of curiosity, the, we're at 119,000 balances of September the 30th. Is year over year, is that about where every September 30th is? Are we are we down? Are we up? And where are we at with that? I don't have that calculator. I don't know. Finance director talking to. I don't know if you have that information. We'll check. Uh, first of 2022, we were in 100 and just a little bit of 124,000, so we've been drawing down. Um, we do bring in a little, but it looks like we're slowly uh, inching down the balance with the CEO. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Bud Mance. Alderman O'Brien? Sure. No, I was just going to add, I think it's perfect timing. We've actually talked about this at EDC last week, too, is that, because I know Karen said we'd circle back here, the chairwoman, Janine Molinelli, was just, she used the example of Highwood, which Manager Zabo was able to speak to a lot. It's like, maybe we can collaborate with CEF and we make up the pumpkin event or something like that so it was going to janine was going to take that back to the cef because i learned that she was also on that committee during last week so we kind of like we know it wasn't our realm but as we talked about economic things is that an idea of just maybe we become known for the hoedown or something like that so it was a neat idea that came out of edc that i think janine was going to bring back to one of your future meetings is maybe we become the the gym shoe event on the third Tuesday or third weekend in March or whatever it was. So that was just something we started kicking around to get more bodies to hear too. So that was encouraging to hear new wheels spinning with the group. And she attended our meeting this oh, evening. Right. So she did put it out there and the group was fairly receptive, maybe not as much in the beginning, um, but the great ideas and some, uh, some good things to think about for 2024 as far as really coming up with a big plan. Anything more? Nope, that was it. Just okay. passing on uh, that one. Thanks. Alderman McHale? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been attending the uh, Community Events Foundation meetings for almost a year now. And um, I do have to say that the same individuals show up every single month. It is always the same people, and they are wonderful, and they really put a lot of work into this foundation. They get paid nothing. And um, I have found it a little bit disappointing that there hasn't been much, many new people come in. Occasionally, maybe, I think maybe 
I've seen two new faces in the entirety of the year. Um, we were talking about fundraising, right? That mm-hmm. was one of the initiatives that I brought forth uh, when we first started because I do think it is important for a foundation to fundraise, especially a 501c3. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't tell you how hard it was to just do that tiny event <laughs> with a sip and paint when you do not have people who are willing to help. This is a volunteer committee, and it is so important that everyone is aware that the people that put all of the effort into it our volunteers and as was noted our volunteer crew right now has been the same for a very long time and they are their time is done it they it needs we need more people and younger people Lots to get involved yes table. and they're wonderful they are and they show up man do they show up so that's just one of the um, things I wanted to say I don't know if we want to talk about the schedule right now or if you wanted to make your comments first no I mean, it'll coincide so it's fine okay if you want to so pivot. we did talk a lot about the schedule uh, this at the community events foundation meeting this evening um, I had said that I thought that there was a little bit of redundancy in some of the events that we're doing um, especially in October with the Halloween event um, as we're catering to the same audiences for the hoedown and the October event. And the success for that trick-or-treat event is the weather. Um, and it is also uh, one of those events that <laughs> is very the, – the community is saturated with them. I think that Alderman Bob Mance was not able to attend ours because he was at yet another one. <laughs> so there are a lot of those opportunities. Um, so the cost looking at that is something that I would be interested in maybe seeing if we can move things, shift things around a little bit, as well as some of the other events that, that we have. Um, we did talk about the uh, Economic Development Committee and make, having a destination event where some we'll have other uh, communities come in willing to spend money. And I do think that is important as well mm-hmm. because – Rolling Meadows is sandwiched between many big things, and while we are not them and cannot be them, we can still try to offer something that maybe somebody else doesn't or something a little bit different. So um, that is something that I do think that we should probably do form a subcommittee on. I would encourage the Economic Development Committee to sometimes attend our events to see what is happening and what we're talking about and how these things typically go. Um, us, the same as the um, economic or the environmental committee, um, we're talking about you know we just had that pumpkin recycling event. Why can't we do something cool with pumpkins and launch them off of you know a, the top of a fire truck? I don't know, okay. but we have lots of community um, involvement here, and I think that between the fire department, the police department, and the economic development committee, and every other committee that we have, that there's no reason that we cannot work together to find a really great event and make everybody really happy and put the Rolling Meadows on the map, as uh, Lori has said. And Lori, thank you very much. You do do a lot of work for these events, and it is very much appreciated. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I thank am you. done. I'll <laughs> Um, I, I'll change up my my comments, uh, and I'll, I'll feed off the schedule. And you know, it's it's my own opinion that I believe we have many events, and um, I would not be opposed to reducing the schedule, only for the the simple fact that we do have a, a park district that also complements a lot of our activities with some of their own hosted events. And so, if we were to reduce hours in order to maybe place better efforts or resources on more significant events in order to create greater attraction or greater ROI on some of the events in order to impact that sustainability aspect of this being a standalone 501c3. That would be something I would be in favor of, of course, knowing that the quantity of events that we have currently, they do require a lot of legwork. And when you have the same cast of characters who have all probably exhausted themselves throughout the years on these events, um, it might be beneficial for them to rein back on the quantity and then shift for more quality-driven uh, initiatives in terms of the events. Um, and with, with that said, the, can we assume or operate under the premise that the 501c3 was established more as an incentive to attract donors to participate yes. in our events versus we need to have a 501c3 standalone community events foundation to conduct the events because I know municipalities have it different in a lot of places. Some municipalities don't host their own events, they outsource to event planning 
teams and they have maybe one point of contact within the city that helps with permitting and scheduling and then there are other communities like ours that do a lot in-house um, my my question is what what do we want with the intent of our community events foundation do we want it to continue operating as an independent 501c3 which i believe we need as a result of having those incentives in order to to generate donations and make it seem more feasible for donors to to give greater in numbers um, but with that comes then the question should it operate entirely at some point on its own autonomously from the city being driven by the revenue that it generates from the events and from the <coughs> fundraising that it does. And I'm curious to know what the council has to say about any of those aspects to see if we can give staff and the city and the events foundation and the events team uh, greater direction so we can help with this as it moves forward. Alderman Vicesi? Yeah, to me, because I, you know, I do have quite a bit of experience with volunteer organizations. Um, with this being no different than than any other one and the lifeblood of these things is recruitment so uh i would think that any media thing that we have at our disposal and maybe you're already doing it but it should be flashing on the sign over here it should be in our news and views it should be everywhere you know about recruiting for the uh the community events because what I found is while there's always a core set of people that wind up doing most of the planning and everything uh, new members come in very inspired with a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, energy to help so I would think that would be with the limited resources that the foundation has is do that I'm at a hundred I believe a hundred percent that we should definitely keep the 5013C. I do like uh, our schedule of events. Uh, the Friday Night Rocks um, are starting to draw people from communities. You know, there's people from Arlington Heights that I know that come to every single one of them. People from Palatine. So it's starting to draw some people into our community. So if we did pare down, that would be something I would not uh, want to try and slice off but uh, um, you know I mean all of these events have their have their people like it I'm sorry I'm going no, on quite about honestly it, I, I don't I don't think it should be necessarily exclusively up to the council to determine which no it's the committee's I, I business. think that would be the committee's business based on the lift required um, I think events that are are perpetual or have a steady cadence to them uh, become somewhat easier because mm -hmm. it, it becomes a cookie cutter and as long as you have the resources in place and the scheduling and the timing um, you can kind of just keep it moving on its own propulsion its yeah. own momentum um, <coughs> but from from staff's perspective when it comes to these events and the number of events what is what is staff's and even <coughs> the events committee members the volunteers position on whittling down on the events and focusing greater efforts into fewer events what are what are thoughts what are the thoughts on that I, I think initially they didn't want anybody to touch their calendar um, but I think <coughs> after we talked about it and, and looked at it a little more macro and you know perhaps we should look at bringing outside tax dollars in instead of always just catering to our families and our communities they seemed a little more open to it um, and I think just having different things to look forward to. We've been doing similar things for seven years, and so I think new exciting events might might be really good for everybody. And from what I understand, now that we've been able to partner with local restaurateurs who, who want to serve alcohol, that has given somewhat of a boost to the recognition and the availability of, of other attendees to participate. Um, but again, my, my whole intent with this conversation is I, I would genuinely like to see more quality, not that there's anything wrong with the current level of quality, but more quality, more uh, potential for recruiting outside economy development from mm -hmm. attendees and less, less of a haul in terms of the frequency and the consistency in which all of these events need to take place. If we could have fewer events with, with a 
maybe a more wow factor, mm -hmm. or a bigger wow factor, and a return on that investment of your time and the efforts and resources. I think that's beneficial for the city overall. Alderman McHale, did you have your hand up? I didn't have my hand up, but I do want to make one note when you were talking about the park district. <coughs> like, um, we do have to keep in mind that like my entire ward goes to Palatine Park District, so we have to pay the resident, uh, non-resident fees for those park district services. So it's kind of a, a hard one to swallow when it's like, oh, we provide stuff with the park district. Well, you don't provide it to a lot of my residents, so that's all. I'm j what I was just saying is that the park district hosts a myriad of events, right. and so no, if we were to pare down a couple of ours, um, it, it would be noticed, of course, mm -hmm. but there is also a park district event occurring Absolutely. at that time or, or the next weekend. So mm -hmm. it would just it wouldn't be maybe it would be sorely missed, but I don't I don't know what it would be. But I'm just saying our park district does complement a lot of mm -hmm. the weekends with events and activities too. Alderman Veneziano, I did see your hand. Yeah, up there. thank you. So um, I agree that I believe this committee and in the foundation should be sustainable on its own. Um, with the exception, and again, it's up to the committee, except for certain key events that I think as a council and as a community, as, as our elected officials, that we should still um, kind of have a say over, meaning like the parades, 4th of July. Um, but other events, that would be up to the committee to run, and that would maybe give them incentive to try different events um, if they have to find funding or get donations. Um, you know, maybe you get Gallagher to sponsor a whole event. I mean, so, you know, not, we can't ask Gallagher to sponsor the whole 4th of July parade. You know, so I, I could definitely see kind of splitting that off and keeping those key events that we need to remain city um, ran. But all the other ones, I would love to see this, um, you know, fundraised and, and paid for by the foundation for sure. I, w I want to touch on that, but Alderman O'Brien, you, you had your hand up. As no, well. I was going to say, I've got a similar question to that. Is I'm certainly, kudos, it's a thankless job for all the events that go on. Um, the couple things that came to mind here is you answered one of the questions. I was going to ask you, like, which ones you thought could be withdrawn, but you would defer that back yeah. to the committee. Is because I was taking a look at it. It's like one a month. There's 16 events, if I was counting right. Couple are obviously doubled up. It's line items from Memorial Day parade and ceremony, Fourth of July fireworks and parade. So it's really one a month, which I actually don't think is an overabundance. The one that was coming to mind as I was prepping was the hoedown and Halloween fest. Maybe we make it. I'm totally guessing here, the 21st of October, and split the difference. We have one event. That's the only, in Kevin's logical mind, ones that might be able to be combined. But I didn't think it was a whole lot that 16 when you dedupe the holiday ones. It's an event a month. Um, I'm all for standing on its own things like that, but I guess my question for all the movies, like, it's in our budget. So are you saying we don't budget for anymore? Because I would have a concern with that because I think it would have to be supplemented for sure. But you're saying... No, I would say that those major events, 4th of July and the parades, would still be in our budget. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, but they would need help with, like, wind down or the Friday's rocks. We could not supplement that? I don't know if I'd be in agreement with that because I mean I'm looking to the future that that would right, be a goal. I'm right. not saying nope next year. Right, it off. right. Just because they so have been, be they've started goal. to build and things like that. Absolutely. If we're doing again rough math, 250 grand a year this is about 210 thousand dollars for the events and 40 thousand in staff. It's a quarter of a million dollars. I wouldn't expect a standalone 501 to bring that in, so I would think there would have to be some subsidy. But yeah, to the future, absolutely. Yeah, that would just be my concern is that I think there would have to be some subsidy unless we could get major sponsors. Yeah, and I, I won't name the, the vendors that I've worked with in the past who, who are contracted by municipalities to produce their events, and their, their production creates the opportunity for that event to draw enough revenue to cover it for the following year. And ideally, I think that would be the perfect mm -hmm. situation for us is, is to, at a point in time in the future, be able to, to utilize these events and maybe a significant event at some point throughout the calendar year where it does generate enough revenue because of maybe the scale of that event to then be a significant financial contributor to keep the smaller events going and to keep that larger event going as well. Um, but ultimately, it, you know, it's entirely up to the, the committee as to which events they want to explore, how many they want to explore. You know, one event a month is is not many by any means. Um, 
if you ask the participants, though, it's a lot of work. And now that they've had these same events under their belt for a while, the lift is obviously becoming easier because of muscle memory and resources are in place. And talent is being booked in advance. Um, has, has the Events Foundation ever considered using some of the funds in the coffer to team up with an event production company to explore a possible bigger scale event for the community that could create a revenue generating mechanism to fill the coffer a little bit higher? I think it's a great idea and something we should definitely talk about. Any other questions or comments? I think they'd be open to it. I, I think it would be nice. I think I hear a lot of residents, and now I'm not. This is, I don't want to bring up Diamond Fest, right? But I hear <laughs> a lot of residents who are looking for a, a large scale event within the community. Um, I don't necessarily know how I feel about that at the moment, but I, I do feel like this Events Foundation, as a 501c3, should grow and develop to a point where it is quasi self sustainable. And my, my concerns currently is that we have a 501c3, which is independent from the city, but we do have city staff working and dedicating significant hours to these. And granted, the events are for the residents and for the community, but I, I don't know where the legal lines are from having a tax dollar paid employee working in a 501c3 events environment. I don't know where those boundaries are, and I don't know if, we're, if it's okay, then that's fine by me, but in the long run, is that the most appropriate for us, is, or am I just foolish in this whole situation? I don't know. Yeah, we, we so one of the exercises we undertook in preparation for this was to begin to evaluate and analyze how other communities do it. And the interesting thing about this specific topic, unlike most other things municipalities do, is that no two communities are the same, and there's vast differences between them. Um, we took a look at Crystal Lake and, and a few different entities, and, and each of them have a foundation, but that foundation operates very different from one another. In some cases, the foundation is is the events entity and you know seeks approvals and, and direction from the city. In other cases, it's similar to Rolling Meadows, where it's kind of combined in with the community. Um, Highwood, for instance, started as a um, a spinoff of the city's operation, and then ultimately went <coughs> off and became what's called Celebrate Highwood, and now is an independent entity that coordinates all of the different events that they hold. Now there's the city is still supplementing in a, a variety of ways with staff time and, and certain resources, but the Celebrate Highwood entity is, is pretty much helping to pay for and cover a lot of the, the costs related to events, and they also have a, a pretty significant volunteer pool that they use. So th I don't believe that there's any legal ramifications for, for the city employees to be working with the 501c3. I think it's more so a policy matter um, and, and direction from the city council as to how we want to approach that. The, the council can also choose to amend the, the bylaws and say, you know, instead of three, we have five, and maybe a member of the volunteer committee and an elected official sit on that on the committee. There's 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 a lot of flexibility in how we do this. It's ultimately a matter of how the how the council would like to direct the policy of its structure. And so, to that point, that that is partially what this conversation is supposed to be geared toward with mm -hmm. the council's direction. Mm -hmm. And so, at this time, we need to open up the floor and identify where this events foundation sh should go and what it should appear to look like both in bylaws and in operations. Alderman Sonoyka. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. So I would probably, before making that decision, want a couple of different structures presented to the council. And so it sounds like city staff did a lot of research in preparation for this meeting. I also was invited by Aldrin McHale to join tonight's community events, uh, our community events committee. Thank you so much as well, Lori, for um, being able to participate in that. And the impression that I got was Naperville back in 2015, where we had a significant, like, we, like Alderman McHale had said, really dedicated volunteers who have gotten into a really good, tight uh, lineup. And in, in Naperville in 2015, they decided to go with a uh, entertainment uh, connection, and then they had Pitbull perform at the Rib Fest in 2018, which was wild and crazy and unprecedented and was really successful. I don't know what that's meant for Ribfest going forward or Naperville going forward, but 
th those are some of the examples of those kinds of hybrid um, relationships. So just because you have one successful year, I'd want to know, well, what, what is the benefit for that community going forward? So I think before I would be able to commit to any direction, I would want to know a couple of different avenues to go. Absolutely. And the good news about tonight is there is no direction that's required from right. us here tonight. <laughs> um, but we do need to begin the dialogue, right? right? And so that's what tonight is about, is initiating that dialogue in an effort to help guide the Events Foundation uh, of course with their input so it's mutually beneficial for both the city the events foundation and those who are tirelessly involved with both aspects of this and so we just need to have some sort of input and consideration from council members on that all the by mass so um i'll just say that microphone please that a community like ours is going to be judged by the quality of the events that we hold and that people aren't going to Years later, kids aren't going to talk about how great our plumbing was and how, how awesome the, the sewers were. They're going to care that the fireworks were awesome and that, do you remember going to Diamond Fest or going to this event and that event? And so um, the fact is is that for the less than 1% of our budget that gets dedicated to this, you know, it, it would make up a good portion of the residents' goodwill towards the city. And, and how they think this is a great place to live based on the few activities that occur that are just that that combine us um, and bring us together from different um, 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 different groups of people and, and different cultures that that reside within Rolling Meadows so um, it would be great um, for this for the events foundation to to grow to to have to give some rest to the the volunteers who come and volunteer all of the time and um, and so what we could do to grow this even if it takes a little bit extra uh, from our budget to to assist in that I, I can't imagine that it's gonna not pay dividends because people who are excited about living in Rolling Meadows um, and, and enjoy the the less than 1% of the budget that happens for fireworks and think those things um, they don't complain as much about the 99 percent of the budget and 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 they enjoy living here as a result of those few benefits mm -hmm. so whatever we can do to grow it let's do it and so to that point as, as Lori mentioned that the events committee may be amenable to initiating a dialogue with with a, an events production company uh, just to see what what the temperature is of events these days and and what could fit within our our area geographically and demographically and how it might complement other events that are going on around us in order to make it more complementary. So if, if they would be interested in, in exploring that, I think that's absolutely the way to maybe create greater sentiment with the, the funding that we do allocate. Yeah, um, I wanted to say we, in the, um, found in the committee, we have had, um, I, I think that there should be, once I'm gone, there should be a council person mm -hmm. present at those meetings because I think until I came and before that, I think there was only one other, or I think the council participation has been there was a, a little soft. Before you came in. <laughs> yeah. There was somebody consistently in the... So I think that that might time. kind of be important just mm -hmm. to be able to report those events back and what's happening um, in, in that foundation. We also have had um, representation from the police department, which has been really great because they offer a different perspective, but maybe even have um, public works come in occasionally to um, cause, because I can't tell you how many times we've talked about traffic and we have no idea what we're doing. So. <laughs> 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 Although Fred is there and he is a... a <coughs> Beacon for all of and that. Please so. know we welcome visitors anytime. We love visitors. Well, thank you, Alderman Veneziano. Thank you. So to kind of circle back, um, as far as the CEF's um, board kind of overview, um, kind of to piggyback off of Alderman McHale, I kind of like the idea of having an alderman on the board. I don't know what title it would be. That'd be up to you guys. Um, just because in the every year so I've been here now. This is the first time we've actually had any information really presented to us um, on the Foundations Committee and like 
money, anything really. Like we've always just been given the schedule, here's the events, and that's about it. Um, and I feel that since a lot of the money kind of, and the events kind of cross tangle, it would be residents' best interest to have more transparency to have one of the elected officials um, as one of the executive board members to have some more transparency since that's really what we're really pushing in within the city. Thank you, Alderman Veneziano. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions regarding to the events foundation or the current list of events? Any other comments? If not, then we, we look forward to hearing hopefully eventually what the, the committee members say about connecting with an event production entity and seeing if they're up for the challenge. Hoping they will be and excited to research it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that'll bring us to our uh, third and final item here, which is the Commercial Curb Appeal Incentive and Modifications to Restaurants and Retail Incentive Program. And Ms. Martha, you'll be presenting on this. But I will. This is an initiative from the Economic Development Committee, It, it is. Thank okay. you, Mayor. And we have the two members of the Economic Development Committee who are also aldermen, Alderman Veneziano and Alderman O'Brien. <coughs> I'm going to briefly provide an overview of the policy direction um, that we're requesting from the Economic Development Committee. And then if either of the aldermen who are on the EDC want to weigh in and correct me if I miss something, please do so. Um, the Economic Development Committee has been very active during the recent years in developing strategies to promote economic growth for the city of Rolling Meadows. Um, to their credit, in uh, 2021, they successfully implemented, with the City Council's approval, a retail and restaurant incentive program. More recently, during July 2022, the EDC drafted an incentive program to facilitate um, attractive outdoor gathering spaces at existing properties visible from the public right-of-way uh, to be called the Curb Appeal Grant. <coughs> to draw consumers um, and to foster investment in commercial properties and ultimately, hopefully, to get full occupancy of the tenant spaces <coughs> and to uh, affect quality of life in the city of Rolling Meadows. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the Curb Appeal Grant and then uh, just briefly talk about some recommended um, modifications to the retail and restaurant incentives. Um, so firstly, the proposed curb, curb appeal grant, again, is to support property enhancements that improve the commercial properties in non-residential neighborhoods. Um, this would be a reimbursement-only program, and it's uh, to support outdoor seating and landscaping improvements. Um, as proposed, it would be a 50% matching grant, again, a reimbursement program, not exceeding 25000 for each business location. Um, new improvements cost must be at least 1000 the city may offer more than 25000 if it is deemed to be um, an exceptional value to the community. Um, policy details would include eligible costs would be include uh, construction and installation of the um, seating and landscaping improvements. And the process would be similar to the retail and restaurant incentives in that there would be an application, staff review, it would go to the Economic Development Committee and ultimately approved by the City Council. We haven't developed an application form because, you know, you know, if there's support for the program, we'll go through that detail. Um, the other element that the EDC would like to have uh, your support on are modifications to the retail and restaurant incentive programs. Um, it was discussed and determined that we needed to be more definitive about what is retail for the purpose of the retail grant and to broaden the eligibility criteria to attract possibly um, growing businesses who may not meet the current criteria. So the three modifications would include retail to be defined as um, a business with gross projected annual revenues of no less than 60% from retail sales. Um, in addition to sit-down restaurants, carry-out restaurants would be eligible. And the maximum number of businesses under the, the same business name in Illinois would no longer be three, but it could be up to 10. But finally, and most, I think, significantly, all of these modified criteria and those that aren't modified would be um, stipulated as guidelines only and subject to exceptions if warranted on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so those are the program details. If anybody from the EDC uh, here in the room wants to weigh in, we can just talk about the questions that the EDC is asking, which I can briefly state. Um, is there agreement that the EDC's recommended curb appeal grant is um, appropriate and 
warranted. Um, are there any items missing from the curb appeal grant that we may want to talk about? And is there an agreement on the proposed modifications to the retail and rest restaurant incentive policies? So that's it for me. Thank you, Martha. Uh, Alderman O'Brien or Veneziano? Any? Sure, I can just add, like as uh, Martha said, we've spent a lot of time on this over the last uh, probably three or four months. And a lot of it was what we've talked about earlier, too, even with like Community Events Foundation, is what we can do to get more outside economic development here. Um, so that's why we made the adjustments that we did. And a lot of it was through other research, it is like with the members of the EDC, is hey, what's they, they saw this newspaper article here or there, what successfuls are through the smaller businesses that they've got the networks through. So that's where this came from, was a lot of local research in this, probably the west and northwest suburbs. Um, of how we got to this. That was one thing we did talk about because EDC doesn't have a budget, rightfully so, is that where we drew these dollar thresholds. So that's where a lot of our research came in. Everything, as Martha pointed out, would be contingent upon council approval. Um, so we don't know. It's a, it's a stab in the dark to see how it goes, but the, the dollar numbers weren't ones we just pulled out of a hat. It was based on a lot of research that the members did that seemed to fit with other economic development programs, other municipalities in there we're doing, but we're not sure. Is that Manager Zabo and Martha have said that we've got it someplace, and if it's a big success, we can make it work. Um, so it is. It's kind of a, a toe in the water to see how it does go. So with the possibility of, of this initiative, I, I think it's it's interesting um, right off the bat. I think it's, it's an interesting concept. And, and if other communities are doing it, it's well received and it's, it's working. Um, who am I to be opposed to it? I think we should try whatever we can alternatively from doing the same thing over repetitively. Has <coughs> um, there been any assumed forecast of how many potential applicants within the city we would assume uh, come knocking on our door for this, it, roughly? When we first started this, and it's been a lot of, because we know almost right here is fully occupied, because we started to look at it based on council, was look at the corridor here, but we've expanded. That's why a lot of the updates came through, is I want to say at the time, and Jennifer, you can connect me, like we were like 21 storefronts just between like Plum Grove and Wilkie on Kirchhoff. So that's been drastically reduced based on all the new businesses that have come in. But at one point, it was 21 is what we were just anticipating for this stretch here. But in terms of predictions going forward, we don't know from an applicant perspective, at least not that we've discussed of how many we expect to apply. And, I, and maybe and that helps me um, sharpen my question in terms of qualifying applicants potentially, right? How many areas within the community? Because I know we've talked about certain certain commercial areas within the city that could definitely use some enhancements. Mm -hmm. um, and so roughly how many of those areas do we think outside of maybe the 21 retailers that, that we've counted in a specific area? What, so, are there four, four so five what, regions? So what got EDC started on this was, for transparency, was Walmart Shopping Center. Um, and the old steak and shake and you know the potential raising canes and how can we just potentially make that entire shopping center look much nicer facelift, yeah. you know facelift right like what can we do and being that there's five or six owners involved and you know and and Walmart is the big guy with all these little guys you know around it what what options do we have um, and then it came up after doing much research that other communities were doing these programs and so now obviously this program or grant wouldn't really apply to like the Walmart shopping center because Walmart is a large entity, but then to like that strip center, you know, that has Jersey Mike's and that in there that they could, they could do something and not have to worry about Walmart doing something. Um, you know, so that's kind of where this all started. So just off the bat, we were thinking of those shopping centers that are small, such as here on Kirchhoff, you know, the one right in front of MI Homes that could really use a facelift up front. You know, whether that be the retail shop itself or the actual owners of the properties. Um, you know, because we know some are leased and, you know, some some people may just want to do the facelift themselves, you know, and, and work that into their lease. That's up to them. Okay. And then the, the EDC has found, though, through their research that uh, the improved cosmetics or aesthetics of, of a retailer has brought a greater degree of business within more business. that yeah. specific more location. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when it came to um, seating, like outdoor seating, and I'm not talking dining, just outdoor seating. So if people are walking through the shopping center 
and they have benches, you know, in the shopping centers, um, you know, much like our little Memorial Bell Park right there. There's seating there. People will go walk to the next shopping center and sit down. Um, that was really enticing to the shopping centers. And then so with, and I know you said these numbers are kind of a shot in the dark right now in terms of what, what the grant uh, uh, amount is and, and what we match and what's reimbursed. Uh, but have we used those numbers in any capacity to understand the time in which that um, recognized return on that reimbursed revenue would be? Do we know if this would be an eventually sustainable initiative for us that, that's not eventually detrimental? To our finances so on the on the retail and restaurant incentive it is a tax sharing approach so essentially what it is allowing us to do is that we're, we're earning tax revenue and then rebating back a percentage of it and in the conversations or the way that we approach prospective businesses who are looking to locate in Meadows with this program is that they're filling typically a space that right now we're not getting any sort of tax revenue from. And so would we love for the for a business to choose to come to us organically without any sort of incentive? Absolutely. I, th I think at the, at the core you always look for not giving away <laughs> of course. You know, the, the farm. But at the same time, I think the competitive environment that exists in the area has precipitated communities throughout the region to come up with a variety of different incentive programs. Absolutely. And so, with respect to the retail restaurant, it's it's tied to that to that sales tax or food and beverage tax component. The case by case basis and the way that this is being presented also allows us to evaluate and do a you know kind of an ROI analysis of you know if we provide the assistance for signage and, and the facade improvements because those are very expensive uh, upfront costs for a business before they earn any money um, as well as what the sales tax projections look like whether it's because they have an existing location elsewhere or there's a similar type of restaurant or business in town we can kind of ballpark approximately what that will look like so that when we come to the EDC as well as the council we have that information now on the, on the flip side with the um, the uh, outdoor dining or uh, beautification program it's a little bit more difficult to quantify exactly what that ROI will look like because you don't it's not necessarily tied to additional sales taxes. It's, it's a beautification program. So um, facade improvement programs are, are another type of incentive that exists in other communities for existing businesses. So it's, it's addressing the retention side of, of the business and economic development front. Um, and so it's, it's essentially creating a, a welcoming environment that you would hope people would spend more time in and not just visit one business, but visit multiple within that area that's more beautiful as a result of, of the investment. Okay, so essentially what, what I'm hearing is between your analysis with Finance Director Talkington that this is a win-win situation given the, the current standard of, of pricing that we're looking at that, within the grant. That's, the that's what we've seen from the other municipalities, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's no, there's no hard data yet at this right. point. But con I'm asking confidence levels? Yes, right. yes. Yeah. there's no hard number data because it's... We started this in the spring that some municipalities were just starting this, so there's not enough data to come through yet to know. And, and, and again, the, the beauty of the way this is structured is it's case by case. So every time one comes through, we conduct that analysis. I, we have a pending application that just came in for a restaurant that now we're going to dig into what those numbers look like and you know what are what are the ROI over the period of time. Um, and yeah, and, and we'll just bring it forward with, with our, our recommendation either to support or not, yeah. depending on the outcome. And sometimes it's, it's okay in the absence of data to swap that with confidence. And mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. basically my question is, are you confident at this point within the yeah. committee and between yourself? It, and it's a successful tool. Yeah. That's okay. that's what it gives us. It's a tool for us to attract new businesses as well as retain our, our existing businesses and improve them. Good. Nice. Yep. Any other questions, comments, or concerns regarding this? Alderman Bassetti? Yeah, I was wondering, and it's, I think it's kind of along the lines you were you were going at, Mr. Mayor. Um, is there any kind of a, a a cap, so to speak, on how much that that I know there's an instant for each instance. There's a twenty-five thousand. I'm just saying. Let's say every business along Algonquin, Plum Grove Road, and Kirchhoff applies for this. 
uh, Alderman Biss says, you mean a cap in applicants? Is that yeah, a cap, a cap in applicants or a cap in total number of dollars that the city would expend on this? Or maybe per annum, there's a cap. Or is per there annum? Cap? Currently, there's not. Are we thinking each instance would be evaluated based on return on investment and make That's sure that the it, way pays, it's drafted it now. pays for itself? Is any, if we got 300 applicants, staff would be reviewing 300 applicants making the recommendation EDC would review 300 applications and then council would review 300 applicants correct because like to use your example if Walmart asked for this we probably wouldn't approve it unless it was a total anomaly um, but so right now no there is no cap each one's the, the way it's written is it each one's a case-by-case -case basis and council has final say if I may the, the other control that exists is, is budget so if, if there's an upfront payment we haven't because there's this uncertainty of we don't know if we're going to get applications or not, we tend not to budget for hypotheticals. And instead, right. if an application were to be approved, it would likely come forward to the council with a budget amendment to account for what that incentive amount will look like. So it's it's sort of a two-part uh, approval of, of the incentive package as well as the budget amount for that specific expense. Okay. That answers the question. Thank right. you. Thank you. Well, I say you don't know. We'll start with one. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, trying almost everything once. Uh, thoughts, comments, questions before I go ahead and address these th three directional requests here. Uh, beginning with the first then, um, the show of hands of all those in agreement with the Economic Development Committee's recommended curb grant appeal and the process. Those who recommend this, who are in favor of it. Okay. Those opposed? Okay. Um, so we have the, the first question answered for you there. Thank you. The next question is, are there any items that may have been missed from the curb grant policy and application that should be included at this point before it comes before the city council? Any thoughts on anything that should be added? Uh, good point about a potential cap, mm -hmm. but I think at this point we should just roll out the program potentially and see what happens with the, yeah, the interest as as the Justification is there. Then. Okay. So long as there's some sort of a justification. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Mr. It is okay. Um, it, you know, it's, it's state the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alderman Budman. I'm a little concerned that if we get 300 applications. <laughs> oh, I'm a little concerned if we get 300 applications that we're going to spend quite a bit of time reviewing 300 applications. So maybe we could limit it to the first 25 applicants per year. And that just so that every, just everybody understands I don't want to have businesses think that theirs wasn't picked for some other reason, and and so yeah. I, I don't. Know. Well, you're more generous than I. I said twenty. Let's let's shoot for twenty. Uh, but but, but right, whatever. I mean, I'm just yeah. I'm looking for some some limit on the number of applications so yeah. for for all of our benefit. Well, to that point, excuse me. To that point, is there a necessity in advance of rolling this out that that should be spelled out in black and white? I mean. I think there's a benefit to to establishing that in the event that there is a massive influx of, of applications that come in. Um, there's no harm. And reality is, is if, if we do have 50 coming and knocking at our door, we can always revisit that question. Should there be entities that meet that but-for clause and they're you know, a good business that could locate here? So. I think it is a good guide for us to put out publicly and communicate that the program is capped annually. I think helps create a little bit of finite nature to how many are going to come in. But okay, or potentially as we roll this pilot program out, we we start as a pilot program with seeing how the first mm -hmm. up to the first twenty or something. How about like the first twenty approved applications? Well, yeah, because twenty could apply, but maybe only one qualifies. And it comes in order as received, obviously. And that's that's wise. Um, but to that point, then what if the 300 do apply and we're still trying to find the first 20 that apply? I think, Alderman Budmans, was your concern that staff time be exhausted with Well, if the first 20 are number? approved, then the next 280, we approve the first 20. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. they come in in batches, though, of 50 or so. You know, I don't know. Okay. I, what we don't, I think where you're going with this is that you don't want to exhaust staff resources on, right. on sifting through applications and then moving those on to EDC to then sift through as well. So is, is there some sort of vernacular that we can incorporate um, in order to, to 
ultimately minimize the amount of potential staff time so that we can at least get the program a fighting chance without exhausting staff's resource time. I think I think that's a real good idea, Mr. Mayor and Alderman Bud Metz. My concern would be a similar Alderman Veneciano's is if we get 20 in and none of them pass the sniff test, I wouldn't want to shut the program down by February. Oh, goodness, no. <laughs> yeah, no. So no. that would be, yeah. But, no, I agree some type of cap is not a bad idea. And I think EDC would, clearly this takes precedence over the EDC, but I think they'd be amenable to that, too. Yeah, it makes sense. So I think the general takeaway for this evening is that prior to this ruling out, there will be some language defined. I think that the council is in agreement by show of hands that we should include some sort of cap clause in here. Mm -hmm. So quick show of hands to those who support that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we'll include that in the, the ordinance and resolution that comes forward for when this is officially approved at a future council meeting. Perfect. And then um, the, the last and third question here is, is there agreement on the proposed modifications to the retail and restaurant incentive policy? So I think we've made some modifications. Mm -hmm. and I think we're all in agreement as it stands right now with the conclusion of this conversation. Um, so show of hands is from what we've taken away from this discussion this evening. Show of hands of those who are in favor of, of allowing this to move forward from this table. All right, so it's unanimous there. Well, with that concluded, we finished the three subjects for this evening. And now I'll just look at Alderman O'Brien. Okay. Going back to our previous discussion about uh, last council meeting, we did pass the first reading for the application fee to cover staff. Do, you, do we want to ask staff to include that where if somebody applies for these, it's a $50 fee? Because we did tack that on to 6B and 7B. I think it was a $1,000 application fee. That might help cut down of somebody just throwing at the wall and seeing if it sticks. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if you were going to open it back up for questions because I would have been certain. Just a thought because we did pass that for the 6B and 7B. I don't know. $25. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, it goes back to the modifications. Uh, this, the second question of catching any modifications we'd like to see included. So, I mean, there's nothing official about tonight, so we can absolutely back up and have that conversation okay. while we're still on, on this subject. Um, I guess we'd have to take a show of hands if, if, if there aren't any, you know, rebuttals to that amount. Alderman, so Mike, you have your hand up? I do, yeah. I just, oh, sorry. I just wanted to respond to that. In the 6B discussion, we had a lot of comparisons from city staff on what other communities were doing, and we would be consistent with other communities. For this particular incentive, is it is it typical to have an incentive program like this associated with a fee for staff time? Like not, staff that, fee. not that we saw in our research, but... Alderman oh, Budman's had a very valid point. It could be a lot of staff time, so that's why the light bulb went off, but not in anything that we found. Great point. So I would, because this is an incentive program, I wouldn't want to de-incentivize the use of the program by tacking on that fee unless it's consistent with other communities. So for that reason, I would say at this time, no, if there was no evidence from your research from comparative policies. Is that what you seem to? Yeah, the, there's, yeah. there's some scenarios where communities who aim to attract car dealerships will add a fee because of the amount of work that goes into analyzing a car dealership build out um, and those are typically in the thousands so I think for the types of businesses that we're attracting it may be a disincentive to affix a fee that high um, but we haven't seen for, for smaller application amounts similar to what we have here we haven't seen it in practice typically but it's, it's doable. So we won't slash no. the tires before it gets rolling? No. Okay. <laughs> so could we just say that, that we'll provide, as an incentive, we're going to provide up to X number of staff hours as, at no charge, and that, but that if your application is complex enough that it requires additional staff time beyond the normal application, whatever that is, five hours, ten hours, I don't know what that number is, but whatever it is, that a, um, a fee or a, a cost to reimburse would be expected. So, something like that because if they're asking for 25,000 back versus if they're asking for 2,500 I mean there, there could be some considerable time spent and so I mean within reason I mean if we're going to spend an hour or two okay if we're going to spend 10 hours 20 hours then maybe we need to be reimbursed for that so to that point what is the perceived process in evaluating the property for these curb appeal enhancements, what what is it? What does it consist of? Does it consist of an, a site visit, or do we know the properties well enough where we can just take what what they're showing us on the schematic and 
and make the determination. If, if I could weigh in quickly yeah, on please. that. Um, uh, the, essentially, the approval process will require that permits must be obtained as necessary, and so through those channels, those permit fees would be charged. Um, and you know, any any other process that requires um, a PUD amendment approval, if they're doing a bump out into a parking lot at a shopping center, chances are it needs a PUD amendment approval. That's going to include a fee as well, and those would be this. I think it's the substantive review uh, levels of review of these projects. Um, for the financial side, um, I think you know it would probably not take a lot of time. And again, we, we don't really have the metrics either to, to put forward. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, thank you. And uh, you know, back to Alderman <coughs> Budman's point when it comes to staff time and how much time is is spent on an, on an, on any given application, and at what point is that time spent up front on the analysis of of the application to make the determination or um, Reviewing the the application and making a quick determination. Yet yeah, this is this is one we'll move forward, and then the time is spent thereafter, uh, more heavily focused on the actual uh, beautification aspects. Where where is the staff time? Is it front end loaded, or, or is it after? It's it's typically on the front end because we're we're looking for plans. You know, what, it, typically a landscape design or some sort of plan to identify exactly what changes are being proposed would be part of the application. Um, so a lot of it is, is up front because you know, staff is evaluating it, going back and forth with the applicant, preparing it for presentation to the EDC, thereafter taking the EDC recommendation. So that's really where the time is spent. After it's done, it's, it's really in the wheelhouse of just verifying that the plan was built in accordance with, the, that the project was built in accordance with the plan. Yeah, and so forgive me if I may not have read it in here as to what the process, the application process actually looks like. Do they have to have blueprint architectural schematics available in advance with the cover letter and all of that good stuff? I, ideally, and if yeah. not, that would be when we possibly gets kicked back or we deny it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I appreciate the, the observation. Um, in development of the application form with Melissa Wolf, we can certainly include you know the level of detail required up front. Yeah, similar to what we currently do for any community development mm -hmm. permit application sure. where you have your list bullet list of, mm -hmm. of items that are required in advance. Mm -hmm. So we're not playing back and forth, back and forth. We're wasting people's time. Right. Yeah. So we're applying for So is it safe to say then that the applicant is going to be more invested than we are based on their, their submittal is going to it's going to cost them more something. to produce than it is for us to review. Yeah, certainly, but part of the process, I think, will it should require a pre-application meeting with city staff so we can kind of level out what needs to be done to make this um, something that we can support. Yeah, but we can, we can, we can work that through in the application uh, process. Yeah, and I think this evening it's just a matter of giving the green light. That way you guys can now uh, refine and sharpen the pencil, create the documentation that we can review at the council level during a city council meeting, make any amendments or modifications there, and then put it through for a second read. Any other questions, comments, or concerns on the topic now? I'll move right no, sure. sorry for the additional 10 minutes. It was no. just the light bulb. <laughs> All right. So Seriously, or motion to adjourn? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll look for that motion now. Seconded. Thank you, all. Seem like it for the second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. This meeting is adjourned at eight fifty-three. Have a good night.